So I'm going to talk about implementation challenges facing controllers as they look at the new standard and then wrap up with some ideas and then we'll take questions. So when you think about enterprise lease accounting, it's really about how do I, how do I take where we are and the new standard and kind of operationalize it, right? Deploy it in my company. So when the new standard came out about a year ago, controllers deployed their, um, the, their, their, their technical accounting policy uh, leaders to kind of study the mechanics of the standard, really focused on kind of the output, right, the substantive audit, you know, the financial disclosures, and kind of work backwards from there. So when they did that, they, they really kind of uh, focused on FASB or IFRS or both, whatever is relevant to them. At the time, focused on kind of cost to implement to try to come up with some budget numbers and, um, you know, focused on the accuracy of the calculations given the complexity and the standard, right? So they're looking for software that could do the calculations. And then as they thought about, okay, you know, how do we actually get closer to where the transactions are happening, right? Because you got to get the data from somewhere. And so they started to focus on the data. They realized there's really three different processes within most you know, international large companies, right? Different people and systems for real estate, you know, equipment leases typically managed on spreadsheets locally if managed at all, and embedded leases, which nobody was really tracking, right? And service agreements, but really kind of different stakeholders with different motivations for each one of these kinds of leases, right? So most people started focusing on real estate leases because they had that data. They typically have a real estate lease administration system, but they didn't have any system to do the accounting. And so kind of when they really kind of unpacked how do we operationalize a standard and how do we proceduralize in the field in a decentralized way while still keeping it kind of lightweight, right? They, they, they then started to understand the magnitude of the challenge within their business of operationalizing this. And this is on the heels of RevRec, right? Um, and they realized they need different process controls and kind of systems for both the administration and the management and then the accounting of these three different lease types, right? And the process controls become really important. So what we did is we, we kind of looked at, well, well, we talked about accuracy, we talked about completeness, when you think about the data, when Bruce brought up a really important issue, which is timeliness, right? Because data changes along the lease term, especially the equipment data. Um, for our customers, we see 30 to 40% annual change um, in the lease data at the asset level over the course of a year. And the only people who know about those changes for the most part, and again, the judgments, decisions, and events that impact the accounting are the people in the field. So how do you use email and lightweight tools to kind of capture that information from them, either ping them with an attestation request or automate notifications if it comes to the end of term so that you can check all these boxes, reduce your risk, and kind of ensure compliance, not just in the substantive audit, right, but working backwards through that whole audit trail back to the front of the transaction, really the decisions before the transaction that put it in place. How do you archive, archive all these pieces so they're referenceable for accounting purposes. So you also can kind of address the SOX issues, right? Well, step one, again, back to the accurate calculations. You need a subledger that can deal with all lease types, right? Equipment, real estate, embedded leases at the asset level. And you can plug your existing systems, the real estate lease administration. Most companies already have a real estate lease administration system with a real estate team. So you want to be as unintrusive as possible. You may have to do a bit of a gap analysis on the data that they have, you know, but if they're happy with their system, leave it in place. But plug in a global lease accounting engine that's easy to federate across your different ERP systems. Many large companies have grown by acquisition, and they typically have multiple ERP systems. They all might be headed towards one. Even some of the people that are have standardized, they'll have multiple instances of the same software. They don't want to have to install a separate piece of software on every instance, right? And then have to do kind of a roll up in order to get the company or consolidation to get that company wide disclosure, right? So you want all that kind of automated, you want to be able to federate, but still have each individual entity only need to look at and have access to the data that 
that, that's relevant to them, right? So it looks like it's their own. Um, and so you really want the automation to kind of connect the people in the field, the stakeholders who are transacting, make it lightweight for them to, to share their judgments, decisions, and events, create that process transformation so you get that timely data on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, and have it all roll in. Because at the end of the day, you can't afford to have any of this stuff impacting your close at the end of the quarter, at the end of the year, right? So, um, you know, if you put the right system in place, it's easy to integrate. It has all the features that you're going to need to comply and really manage the portfolio across your company. Then you really kind of shift your burden from an implementation planning standpoint to the data collection, which is really where it should be, right? Um, most companies just don't have good control over their non-real estate data portfolio, right? And that's really where the bulk of the work is. You got to find the contracts. Typically, especially with equipment leases and embedded leases, there's typically multiple documents involved five to 12 documents that you have to pull data from in order to fully populate the system. And then you have all the kind of ancillary data that Bruce talked about, um, chart of accounts, GL string definitions, um, corporate hierarchy that you need to configure the software to be able to load the data, right? But configuring the software and automating it shouldn't be the issue. It really should be a focus on the data collection. And this is another point of emphasis you know, most people, again, like Bruce said, they're very focused on the lease start, meaning, okay, in order to prepare for the standard initial date of application was January 1st, 2017. I got to have three years of comparables for income statement purposes, two years for balance sheet. I got to get the data for that whole period, and I got to get it current as quickly as I can. Um, but once I have it on the system, I'm good, right? Um, but it goes back to you really need to to try to make it easy and lightweight for yourself, you know, globally to capture those judgments, decisions, events across the lease life cycle, even during the term. And not just for pure accounting compliance purposes, but, um, you know, to manage the business effectively internally. And then, uh, you know, also generate savings, you know, uh, negotiating buyouts, for example, improving your return performance so you can really get the savings that can come from leasing, for example, on the back end or on the front end, um, really looking at your spend, figuring out how can you can aggregate the spend to, to drive down costs uh, from your lease capital, right? You can save a lot of money in this process if you manage it right uh, as well. So uh, the final point um, here is just that if you look at the deadline, January 1st, 2019, most companies locked down that last quarter for SOX 404, right? We really only have six quarters from where we are to take this project on, right? And you want the software and the configuration of that to be as minimal, uh, you know, an issue as possible so you can focus on the big things, which is the data collection, making sure that's done the right quality way, um, and the process transformation, making sure that's done. Um, but there's still just not a lot of time, right? So a quick summary and then recommendations and we'll take questions. Um, the key criteria for implementation planning, software selection, and day two execution are these criteria here, simplicity, speed, control, and savings. That's what we try to touch on during, the, during this discussion. Um, having one lease accounting sub-ledger ledger that, that generates, that basically takes all information for all leases um, in one subledger, it, re it reduces the number of integrations that you need to have, um, and you can you should be able to use just that one data set to report under current standards and new standards, right? Um, and then you you, you really want to make sure that it's easy to federate across all ERPs, so that you really have again fewest integrations, shortest implementation time, um, and it, this will also accelerate your your day two close. And the last point is automated lease classification, right? When you start thinking about, oh, I got to go from contract to asset level, it sounds really daunting. Um, you can get a lot of this information from lessors if you don't have it internally. Um, clearly, the real estate system will have the real estate asset information. IT asset management systems used, your IT organization will have some of that asset information. Um, but being able to take that data in a structured way, put it into worksheets, and then load that into the system, and after you set the thresholds, have the system perform automated classifications that 
So the classification step um, is reduced to just exception management by kind of a trained accountant. That'll save you money and capturing that historical portfolio in time. But also, as you move forward on the other side of uh, implementation, uh, and just closing the books on a monthly, quarterly basis, right? So try to give you some good ideas about how to take on the standard based upon things that we're seeing in the market, hope you have a better sense of asset level lease accounting. And with that, um, I'll, I'll say thanks to Bruce, and I'll turn it over to Steve to wrap it up and MC the questions. Great. <clears throat> we have time for uh, maybe two or three questions here. Let's first start with one that I will uh, ask Bruce to answer. And the question uh, is, how does the decision of uh, whether you choose asset or contract level lease accounting factor into uh, Sarbanes-Oxley SOX compliance? Well, Sarbanes-Oxley is, is uh, do I have my mute off? Yes, I do. Uh, Sarbanes-Oxley is all about having you know, controls and procedures in place to be able to generate accurate financials, or accurate debits and credits. So if you can't, you know, if you cannot do that because you don't have asset level accounting or you don't have asset level controls, you don't have asset level management, then you're not SOX compliant. So yes, I mean, all of the things that I was talking about that impact the ability to generate debits and credits at the asset level are required for SOX compliance. It's critical. Um, that's, that's pretty much it, Steve. Yeah, there's a, there's a question here that came in from Michael Corcoran. Um, if this assessment implementation is not completed in 2017, won't it be very difficult to get comparative information under old and new standards once adopted in first quarter of 2019? Um, let me take a quick crack at that, Bruce, then you can, you can take it. Um, I think if, you know, we're already past January 1st, 2017, you just have to claw back the data from January 1st, 2017, and try to make it as accurate as it as it as it as it as, as it was, right? So uh, it's a challenge. The farther you get away from that date, the harder it is to kind of capture that data. Bruce, you want to make a comment? Yeah, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. Um, if for December 31st filers, you know, March 31st, 2019, they're going to have to have three years income statement comparative to years balance sheet. Now, you know, there's there's other issues that need to be considered. Or, you know, are they electing the practical expedience? You know, what information do they currently have available? So it's it's on a company by company basis. But in general, um, you know, if you don't have, if you don't know exactly what you're doing, and know exactly what information you have today, and all of the complexities associated with the standard, then you know that would, is a very very risky scenario of not having it completed in 2017. Okay, let's try to squeeze one last question here. Uh, Michael, um, the other question that we got was, uh, who else uh, beyond accounting and the controllership really needs to be involved in this discussion? There were a number of other uh, asset owners mentioned during the, uh, the webinar. Well, the people who are the asset owners and asset users are going to be important um, because they have, you know, current knowledge of the assets. And the leases, so you got to get the con you got to get the data. Um, and I would say that the, the way that we're seeing it manifest in the market is there's really two approaches. There's one is I just want to do my critical path to compliance, like, and the critical path to compliance is is is, is try just to kind of get the data and get in a system so you can, you know, you can you can, you have all the data and you can generate your disclosure, right? But the, the bigger picture approach that we're seeing companies come back around to, especially the you know, ones that have bigger portfolios um, and essentially have more at risk, is that they have to interact with procurement to try to fix the process in the beginning because, because a lot of times the, the data that are going to result, they're going to be able to capture internally is fragmented because a lot of just they don't have it. So if you fix the process in the beginning, you can ensure that when you do a transaction, you have all the data at the time of the transaction. So that over time, your database gets better and better quality, right? And the auditability goes up, right? So procurement slash sourcing on the front end, treasury sometimes is responsible for the leasing program, right? Because it's kind of balance sheet optimization and there's, there's, there's capital markets players involved, you know, counterparties or banks or leasing companies, right? And so so, you know, sometimes they want to be involved. And, of course, there's a lease versus buy analysis 
component, then they're going to be determining what those rates are for each country. And um, so they're going to have to be involved, right? And you need to figure out the incremental borrowing rate for every month for every lease. So you're still going to have to interact with them to get that um, on a routine basis, right? And on a historical basis. Um, and then uh, the operations as well, right? So, you know, those are the players that we see around the table for pe people who really want to put in place a long-term, sustainable, scalable, transformed process. So I hope that was helpful.